testing. The audio seems to be a little low. Let me know how it is. Can you hear me? Sorry about the brief delay today. All right, great. Yeah, I had to let somebody borrow my microphone for the weekend, so I had some settings changed up this time. All right, well, thank you, um, and hello, everyone. Welcome back to my home office, I mean to our class. Um, today we're going to be talking about, first of all, drinking water, um, kind of the, the motivation why we care about drinking water, which is kind of obvious. We'd like to, to be able to have nice, clean, fresh drinking water that's healthy to drink. But more specifically, how we are um, going about regulating it and the different health aspects that we actually look at. So I want to um, elaborate a little bit on some of the context and some of the ideas that we, we need to use for water and wastewater treatment. Okay, so last time we did the chemistry refresher, uh, this time we're doing drinking water, and then we're gonna take a look at sedimentation. And uh, before I go further, let me say that um, I've posted homework one, and I'm gonna go ahead and write this up here as well. I posted homework one, I think it's due, I think I put it Saturday or Sunday night over the weekend. I do apologize for not giving a full week. I usually try to, um, but I, as I was looking at the schedule, our, I wanna give you about a full week for both homework one and homework two. These are both a little bit smaller than usual homeworks because we've got four homeworks, two for the first exam and then one for e each of the next exams. So it, just the way I've organized it, there, these two are a little bit more compressed. So let me just write this for anyone who joins later. And I sent an email about that, so hopefully everybody um, ends up seeing that. Okay, so with that, um, let's get started. And of course, feel free to ask me questions along the way. If you do have homework related questions, I'll probably reserve those to the end. And if I have not answered by, you know, towards the end, just send a, a couple more messages to get my attention. Okay, so for the fundamental motivations um, of water and wastewater treatment, and actually I, I just distracted myself. I realized normally I have a chat box that displays whatever chat is happening over here. And I just noticed it's not, not um, functioning. Okay, I'll test that out later um, offline. Okay, anyway, so drinking water. Why do we care? Why do we want pure water? Well, some of it's obvious, but specifically I wanna get into what goes wrong. Why? Why shouldn't I just <clears throat> drink my aquarium water right there? Um, so there's a lot of considerations. First of all, uh, the water supply determines how we need to treat it. If I did want to drink my aquarium water, let's say maybe the power and the water goes out for several days and I have no access to any other water, that's actually a pretty good option because it, I did fill it with city water. It hasn't been contaminated with too many animals. I mean, I've, I've brought live fish in there, so there's some contamination. So there's going to be bacteria and potentially parasites that I don't want, um, but it's at least not water that I'm collecting from uh, that has runoff from a cow pasture or something. So the, the way I would need to treat it then would be primarily getting rid of any uh, chemicals that I may have added for helping keep the fish happy and healthy and any um, in, in some sort of disinfection to kill any bacteria or viruses or other pathogens. So the, the water supply determines the type of treatment. Um, and ultimately, when we consider what types of contaminations are, are going to bother us for water and um, what kind of treatments we need, um, we one of the primary issues is waterborne diseases. 
most waterborne diseases are pretty much the fecal oral route of transmission. So just as it sounds, what's going on here is if we imagine a river, and we have this river, the water's flowing, and let's say it's kind of flowing in that direction, we want to have water, we want to take from here, and we want to be able to withdraw it and then put it maybe into a, a little cup and drink from it, right? We want to be able to um, make use of that water and happily drink it. The problem is upstream we have cases where we have toilet and it flushes and this discharges ultimately into the river. Now there the thing here is and I, I love watching in person everybody's face when they, they see that I'm drawing a toilet um, in class because it's always everyone always thinks it's a little funny and awkward which it is. Um, the thing here though is that we have two places where we can control right we can add controls right here, like a, a barrier um, for treatment, and right here, right? So those are the two control spots that we want to, to make use of in order to prevent um, fecal matter to end up transporting into our bodies, into our guts through that oral route of transmission. Now there's complicating factors here, of course, because in nature we have little animals, di different types, and I'll just draw some sort of stick figure animal that you can decide what type it is for yourself. Let's give it some ears. And of course, ultimately, animal scat, animal fecal matter, is going to get into the river as well. So it's important that we have both barriers, right? Because for one, we want to be able to do recreation in the river. Um, we, we don't want all that sewage to be directly going in there. We're going to discuss more reasons for that later. Um, but for two, we, we want to make sure that our uh, drinking water, we have a barrier there as well to catch anything else. You know, even if we had perfect wastewater treatment, we're not treating all the other sources of contamination in other systems. Okay, so that's kind of the big picture. Drinking water treatment then is this barrier. And we're gonna look at the other barrier. And of course, this is a barrier to other, other things that might hurt the wildlife, might um, be toxic, some other, other things that maybe we don't care too much about in terms of the fecal oral route of transmission. But essentially that, that phenomenon, the, the fact that fecal matter can be ingested and that leads to sickness, um, that's a good fundamental look at the, the motivation and the processes involved with um, regulating our, our drinking water and even our wastewater. Yes, thank you, I was wondering about that. Um, let, me, uh, let me try something real quick. Again, I, I had to let someone borrow the mic and it, I was worried this might be trouble. So pardon me one moment while I try a couple things. Okay, I, let me try one other thing, and if not, I can switch microphones. Because it doesn't look like it's better yet.
testing. All right, so I'm just going to switch microphones. This looks like it's better on my end. Does that does that sound better? How how does this volume sound? Is this good? Testing. Let me know. Type in the chat. Loud or not clear? Okay. This is a different microphone. Um, I do apologize for that. I again, I had to lend some of the microphone. I'm going to try a, a different sound setup um, probably next time I, I'm waiting for a USB extension cable. Um, so I'll have a microphone a little bit closer. Hopefully that'll help. Okay. No problem at all. I'm sorry for the uh, distraction delay. Thank you guys for letting me know um, and for asking about that. <clears throat> okay, so back to the drinking water. Maybe. There we go. Okay, so I mentioned the water supply is very important. And in terms of there we go. in terms of the what type of treatment we need, it's going to depend on where we're getting our water. If we want to take seawater, for example, maybe water from an ocean or an estuary, we're gonna to have to treat it quite a bit to remove the salt. So we're gonna to have to uh, undergo desalination which is going to cost quite a bit of energy, typically. But otherwise, um, you know, that, that process will take care of a lot more than just the salt, so that's probably gonna be um, most of what's required. If we're taking precipitation, if we're taking rainfall, we're not gonna require much treatment, and it's probably going to be simply making sure that there's no um, added uh, contaminants from just the atmosphere, probably disinfection for prudence, and then you can drink it. And if you had to select a, a water source to drink without any treatment, rainfall would be one of the good ones. Uh, glacial melt would be another good one because that, that really does come from the precipitation, but it also has a process of as it freezes, sometimes it excludes some of the contaminants. And generally, if you are way up in a mountain, there's really nothing above that's going to contaminate um, contaminate that water aside from whatever was in the rain. So that's another good good place where you might not need really any treatment. And we're just looking at the, the entire water cycle right here. If you've got surface water, if you imagine trying to drink straight from the Mississippi River, you, it's pretty clear that there's going to be some treatment needed to make that so that you're sure that it's healthy and safe. Um, groundwater does a pretty good job with some natural filtration, so there's not too many uh, or too high a risk of bacteria or other contaminants typically, although there are often concerns for um, heavy metals. Uh, if the groundwater, if the minerals down there simply have a lot of arsenic, for example, that, that can be a problem. Then in terms of um, so in, in terms of the biological part, groundwater is pretty good, usually. And the caveat here is if you don't go deep enough, maybe you're getting contamination from um, from the uh, the surface. And so yeah, there's a question there. Is it a myth that water seeping through cracks and rocks is safe to drink? So if you find if you find, let's say, a, a sheer rock face somewhere, um, maybe on a mountainside, where you have um, rocks and you find water seeping through um, in some cracks maybe on that mountainside, I think that's probably what you're referring to. Um, so let's take a look at that example. So in this case, we'll have water kind of seeping out from different cracks here. If you have that type of water, what, what's going on is you actually have a groundwater system where you have, let's say the earth looks kind of like this, 
and then it drops off like that. And the water table usually follows the, um, the slanting of, of the earth above it. So you, you typically think you have the groundwater is X number of feet below the surface. And so maybe your groundwater aquifer is something like this, and it's kind of following the slope. But then when you hit, it, it doesn't follow it quick enough. When you hit this cliff side, you get um, that sharp edge, then water is coming out. So in some cases, this means you have access to potentially a deep aquifer. Um, so sometimes you have water coming out of a crack like that where uh, it really is groundwater that is relatively safe to drink. Um, there are still issues if you have contamination from, you know, if it's a not a very deep aquifer and maybe there's plenty of animals and stuff that are contaminating and stuff that you don't want. Um, there's potential for it to be contaminated and not good to drink, um, but this is a better source than just simply a stream along, you know, along a path that certainly animals are all around and, and stuff like that. So there's, a, there's some truth to that, but I would definitely say it, there's uh, some other factors at play as well. It's a good question. Okay, so in terms of what our treatment systems look like, um, you know, that was kind of the, the natural water cycle we were just looking at. You can kind of think of this figure from our book as the engineered water cycle. So we, we take from any source of um, natural water systems, maybe it's a stream, maybe it's a lake or reservoir, maybe we're taking from groundwater, um, wherever we're taking it from, we're going to first treat it in our wastewater, or our, excuse me, our water treatment plant. This is our drinking water treatment. So the drinking water is what's being uh, sent out from there to a distribution system. We also would call this potable water, by the way. This is uh, another term for water that is intended as drinkable. Um, it's called potable. So whatever the source is going to determine what treatment steps are in here in the treatment plant, and then it discharges or is uh, sent distributed to our homes, to whatever industries make use of it, and you know, to whatever other purposes we use from our, our city water. Now, industry sometimes needs to clean it further. Maybe it, some industry needs really pristine, pure water, and it has its own treatment system then in place to take the relatively clean um, city water and purify it further, maybe dechlorinate it, uh, whatever is needed. So this water distribution system, often you know, we can consider it as, in a sense, part of the treatment. And I say that, and this will make more sense when we go over the, the Flint water crisis, but the, essentially the, the fact that we have some residual disinfection happening in the distribution system and we have potential for contamination, um, we have to manage it as if this is part of the treatment to make sure it's operating properly and um, serving us well. Okay, so from here, now we have our wastewater treatment, which is going to be effectively our, that second, or, or the, you know, depending on how you look at it, whether you're upstream or downstream, this is either your second line of defense before you go to the nature, or your first line of defense before anybody else withdraws water for use. Um, because inevitably we are almost always downstream of some other wastewater discharge. Which is again why it's very important to clean our water um, to high standards. Okay, so then from there our homes discharge water, industry discharges their wastewater. Um, a lot of times they'll have to pre-treat it so that it's not their whatever toxics and chemicals that they're discharging do not harm or um, cause the uh, wastewater treatment 
the municipal wastewater treatment to fail. Sometimes they can discharge straight to um, to a, a system on their own if they've treated it sufficiently. Sometimes they pay the sewer um, to take their wastewater. Now those two, whatever feeds, whatever flows come through there, those will go straight to our wastewater treatment plant and sometimes in uh, not so good scenarios we have what's called storm um, storm water so combined storm systems then the storm water flows and enters the wastewater treatment to catch any of the road debris or any pollution coming off the roads in the wastewater treatment plant now that sounds nice to catch the uh, the wastewater you know to catch the the bad stuff from the roads before it enters our lakes and streams but it's actually a lot better to separate this flow this is something that's happening more commonly now is to have separated storm sewer systems because what we don't want is for a flood to happen if the if the storm sewers are connected to our sanitary sewers then what can happen in a flood event is we overflow the wastewater treatment and then we have escape of combined sewer overflow so we've got that raw sewage plus the storm sewer runoff entering our lakes and streams and that's um, a health hazard for anybody around and that's essentially taking our wastewater and directly discharging which is exactly the opposite of what we're designing the system for so this is m more and more being banned and infrastructure that has been in place to combine the flows uh, throughout the nation are slowly being separated uh, to fix this issue. So how, would, how then would we treat the stormwater is a great question. Um, and really the, the primary treatment for stormwater is sedimentation. So we're gonna we're about to launch into this section actually, but if we have <clears throat> if we have runoff from roads, let's say roads and water is running off, um, typically the the pollutants that we're really interested in are um, suspended solids, so particles, um, uh, small debris, things like that. Um, we also often call this total suspended solids. And so that, that's the primary thing. Um, if you imagine a construction site and there, it rains on the construction site, you get a lot of dirt that's been, uh, you know, maybe excavation is happening and there's a lot of dirt everywhere. This runoff, if it goes straight into a stream or a river, that runoff um, will cause now the, the river to be cloudy and murky and that's potentially damaging to the wildlife. Um, in fact, often it's damaging to the wildlife. It's, in a sense, it's like, okay, it's just dirt and dirt gets kicked up into the river all the time, but that amount of exposed dirt has um, more organic carbon that's going to be with it. It's going to be a lot more silt and um, suspended solids than normal, and so, stormwater runoff from construction sites turns out to be a pretty good um, example. So then what you do is you send it through some sort of retention pond or sedimentation basin where as the water is flowing slowly through it, the particles will be falling to the bottom and get collected here and a little bit cleaner water will be flowing out the other end. Um, so that would be, that's going to be kind of our sedimentation um, process. Usually it's going to be just some sort of retention pond. You probably have been learning about this um, in your civil engineering classes for, for you civil engineers where alongside a construction site there are requirements to have um, runoff controls um, whether that's the semi-pervious barriers that should catch most of the silt or some sort of retention pond um, and uh, in in large systems, sometimes they'll have just simply a, an underground storage tank that allows water to reside there a little bit longer in the case of a big flood. Um, I know some 
uh, some parts of Michigan were starting to design that sort of stuff. Okay, so we'll talk more about sedimentation, um, but that's that's usually enough to take care of um, stormwater. Sometimes you might have concern about grease from the roads or from maybe uh, an auto industry, you know, an auto repair shop. They typically require a stormwater permit because they have to, before they drain all of the stormwater, they have to actually build into their drain some sort of a grease trap so that they're not sending a bunch of grease down um, into the uh, storm sewers. So it's a good question uh, and some interesting challenges there um, to deal with. Okay, so the point of our drinking water treatment really is to disrupt that fecal oral route of transmission. And a good example of that is typhoid fever. Now, eventually we, we developed a vaccine for typhoid and that certainly helped, but essentially typhoid fever is a potentially lethal disease that is transmitted from um, fecal matter to the oral route. So um, a good, you know, this is one of the good examples of uh, one of these food and waterborne diseases that uh, used to be a big problem, but things like chlorination, modern hygiene, um, all sorts of other um, innovations and regulations have really helped to drive down the deaths. Um, so if we're looking here from 1900 to 1950, the deaths per 100,000 population. <clears throat> we used to have upwards of um, 24 people out of 100,000 dying. So that's what 0.024% of the population died every year from uh, typhoid fever. So quite, quite a substantial burden of disease here, um, but we see this drop to nearly zero by, by 1950. Um, some, some countries still struggle a bit with these and you know, anywhere where you don't have as many modern controls for um, water treatment, for food preparation, for food handling, these types of diseases, um, your common, you know, what you know is the common food poisoning stuff, those typically are this fecal oral route of transmission. <clears throat> okay, so in 1974 in the US, we um, developed the Safe Drinking Water Act. This was a set of national standards to deal with toxins and pathogens in particular, um, and essentially we categorize the, uh, the standards that are in place into primary and secondary. So the primary standards really relate to health effects, and these are enforceable because obviously they relate to health. Um, legally, if the, there's a government-run entity that's providing a service like drinking water, then clearly there's some legal issues if it's uh, if they're providing something that's not healthy, uh, because presumably the public should be able to trust them to to do um, to do this well and to provide safe water. That's what we want from our government for sure. So then, what's regulated are chemical aspects, radionuclides. So they are technically chemicals, but uh, you know, it's a slightly different uh, issue here and um, categorization. So we have a different categories there. So radioactive um, materials, chemicals, and then microbial. So obviously microbes can make you sick, chemicals could poison you, and radionuclides could give you radiation poisoning. Um, there's cancer concerns for that as well. So. The secondary effects then, or secondary standards, are primarily aesthetic. So whether or not my water um, has a nice clear color to it, um, maybe maybe I have water that is slightly tinted, um, has a slight brown color to it, but otherwise is healthy, that's certainly possible. Uh, we we put food coloring in our food and eat it, food coloring in our drinks and drink it, and there's no issues. You know, you look at um, some sort of a, really most drinks, most soft drinks or something, they're going to have color, coloring agents in it, and it's not going to be crystal clear. Is it safe? 
presumably so, I, you know, with some caveats about the amount of high fructose corn syrup you're drinking. Um, <clears throat> but these, so these are not enforceable. So long as they are aesthetic and dealing with things like taste, odor, temperature, color, the hardness of the water, all of these are preferences, not um, not mandatory, not you know because they're not health related. Now, you can have cases where you have a sudden change in the taste and odor, something like that, may indicate that there's some sort of a treatment problem. And so it might be good to be wary, but presumably if you are uh, if you are effective at the primary standards, then the secondary we really don't have to regulate them, um, and it's not it's not really possible to or it's it's guidelines that are provided from the federal level to um, down from there. So they suggest you know that there's no taste. They suggest that the water shouldn't have any sort of an odor or a color, um, but that's really just a suggestion that, and it's not enforceable through the Safe Drinking Water Act. Hardness is an interesting one. Um, so depending on where you're from, you know, I know a lot of you are from Louisiana. I grew up in kind of northern Georgia, if I can find my cursor again. Okay. Um, so that's not Georgia. I grew up in this area, and then for two years I lived in Michigan, kind of in this area, and now of course I'm here with you guys, which is probably somewhere around there, this region. Um, and so if you take a look and think about where you visited or where you've been, and it, it depends a little bit on the water treatment of course, but you may recognize that the water feels different, tastes different, um, has different quality in different places you've been. I also grew up um, visiting relatives in Florida, somewhere in there, and they were using groundwater. And so comparing my early childhood to going and visiting my cousins, they had this hard groundwater and it causes soap to act differently. So soap um, operates partly um, or the, the action of soap to make suds and to make foam um, actually relates to the, the presence of minerals. So hardness is a, essentially um, a measurement of different minerals. A lot of times we, we talk about calcium carbonate, CaCO3. Um, so Ca2+, and then there's also magnesium 2+, um, some things like that. These, these hardness levels, or these, uh, these minerals contribute to hardness, um, and the fact that they have this two plus feature, if we have lots of those, it causes um, soap to uh, not foam as easily. And this is just the way it interacts with the, the molecules in sort of a chemical manner. So you can have soft water, that feels like you can never scrape the soap off at all, or really hard water where it, you never really get the soapy feel in the first place. So both soft water and hard water can be a problem, so the recommended range is somewhere in between. So maybe you've used soft water from a, a place where they have reverse osmosis or something, get the very, very soft water. Um, then it feels like you can't get the soap off your fingers or your, your body. Really, it's the soap feeling there. Okay, somebody said they used to visit their dad in Wyoming. They could only water the yard like two times a month, something like that. Yeah, that would be, that's not a water hardness issue. That's more of a water supply issue um, where there's not enough water and so they're they're being careful with how much water you're allowed to use for, for different purposes. Very different and a very foreign concept for anybody that's um, really been in uh, Louisiana with tons and tons of water. Okay, so where do we start 
for water treatment. And as I've already mentioned, sedimentation is where we're going to begin. Um, really, if we think about it, before sedimentation, we actually would want um, a screen or some sort of a bar rack or grit chamber to take care of any large particles. Um, maybe you're gathering river river water and a basketball is floating down the river, somebody lost, and you don't want that going into your water treatment, obviously. So first thing to do is make sure you're screening for large objects and things that would, you know, so you do the large objects and then you'd have some sort of a, a finer screen to get rid of grit. Um, there are things called grit chambers that collect all this grit in a continuous process to dispose of it. Basically anything that would harm your plumbing or your um, your treatment steps kind of in a physical manner. The next and first step uh, is what we call primary sedimentation. And we're going to start learning about sedimentation generally, and we'll see it here. Then typically we'll add coagulation, use use that to cause flocculation, and then have a second secondary, so a secondary sedimentation step. So what we're about to learn is applicable in a couple places in our treatment train, and it's also applicable to um, wastewater treatment. And really that's because sedimentation is convenient. If we can cause particles to drop out of water, it's great. We have, we're making use of gravity, right? So the first step, and, and really water treatment is a good way to look at it in most engineering. What can we do that is cheap and effective first? Because if we can get rid of a bulk of the contamination um, just using gravity, then that's, that's going to be cheap and it's going to be um, really efficient, an efficient use of our resources to do. So really the, the first thing is to use, use gravity here. And so that's going to be really what we're, we're learning about with the sedimentation is how we use gravity and how we can design a system uh, and understand how many particles are we going to remove given the situation. Okay, so we're planning to use gravity. We have particles in solution that are sort of random shapes. Who knows what they look like? Um, and we're going to make things easy on ourselves and assume that instead we actually have a perfect sphere. Okay, so when we're dealing with particles, we're assuming we've got this perfect sphere. We, we know the volume, we know the surface area, we have equations for all of that. Um, we can deal with a perfect sphere a lot easier than we can with these other particles. And it turns out, if we model them this way, they do a reasonable job um, it's a, it's a reasonable comparison in, in most cases. Okay, so how do we model it then? Um, really, to understand sedimentation, we need to do a force balance. And you've probably seen these before. Um, maybe you've done, um, in physics, you've probably done things like answer the question, what's the terminal, um, terminal velocity for somebody, a uh, skydiver before they release their parachute, and then maybe after. Um, there's certain certain um, force balances that we've seen a lot and so what we're going to do with this one is say we have the force of gravity pulling downward so f of g and then we have a buoyant force uh, causing us to go upwards so we have the buoyant force and then we also have the force of drag which is going to oppose whichever direction of movement we have. Normally we're going to be sedimenting, right? Having particles settle downwards. It is possible to use a flotation system and by adding some bubbles, attach bubbles to particles and they kind of stick to it. And then these, are, these bubbles are pulling upwards and we get an upward settling effect and we can design a treatment um, process that way. Those are fairly rare, so I'm just going to draw the force of drag as opposed to the downward motion. So then our force of drag would be 
upwards, force drag. Okay, so just before we even look at the math, let's just think about this a moment. We've got the force of gravity that's going to relate to the mass and the gravitational pull of the Earth. The force of the, the buoyant force is going to be related to the volume of the particle and it's um, the density of water that it's displacing. So if we have the, on the bottom this force of gravity, we have the, the mass of the object and the force of gravity. We can actually find that mass of the object if we know the density of the object and the size. Okay, so that's it. We're going to end up using that approach because it turns out it's easier to find the density of particles um, by, in part, by simple sedimentation experiments than it is to, um, to select the particle and grab it and weigh it. So that's not nearly as um, practical of a, um, of a task to do, to, to select a particle and weigh it. Um, so we're going to we're going to have the force of gravity, and we'll put that in terms of the volume of the particle and its density. And then we're going to have the force of buoyancy acting the opposite, and that's going to be a function of the amount of water displaced, the volume of water displaced, and the density of that water. And that's good because we know we at least have a table, a lookup table for the density of water at different temperatures. And then we have the force of drag, which is going to be a function of the viscosity of the water, how sticky the water is, which changes a little bit in uh, with different temperatures, and it's also going to be a function of the surface area or the cross-sectional area of our sphere. And again, since we're using a perfect sphere, that's going to be a little bit easier. And so we take a look, we have all these terms that I mentioned, and, and ultimately what we want is to find that terminal velocity so that we can decide how long, you know, if we have a sedimentation basin that looks kind of like this, water is flowing through, we need to settle from this point down to the bottom, but while the water is flowing, the particles are going to follow a trajectory like this. So we kind of need to know what dimensions to build this reactor so that that can happen. And that's the, the ultimate goal here. Um, of doing the force balance is finding that terminal velocity, that velocity component that's going downwards. And we'll say that's the settling velocity here, Vs. <coughs> okay, so to write out these force equations, force of gravity, as I mentioned, this is going to be the mass of the particle times the gravity, force of gravity, excuse me, the acceleration due to gravity. We can rewrite this um, as the, instead of the mass, we use the volume times the density. I'm going to put all of these terms up, out in a moment, but let me just say that, so volume times density of the particle, you know, if we look at this, this is going to, let's say, be liters times um, grams per liter, if, if our density is grams per liter. So that ends up giving us the mass, right? That's, um, since density is mass per volume, we take mass per volume times volume and we get volume. The clearer way to write that would have been um, density equals mass per volume. Okay. So hopefully that's clear. We're, we're just substituting instead of mass, we have volume times density to, to get the mass that way. So that's the force of gravity. And then the force, the buoyant force, is actually also using the acceleration due to gravity, but this is going upwards because as we're displacing water, that water would like to fill in below um, whatever, whatever is floating, right? The, that, water is being pulled down by the force of gravity. And so as it's being pulled down, it pushes anything up with that force of buoyancy. It, it's pushing essentially to try to get under something. Now, if you have something that's more dense than water, it's not able to push it up and that thing will sink down. So for this buoyant force then, we have 
the mass of the water displaced times the acceleration due to gravity. And we can rewrite that as, again, the volume of the particle. So we have that volume of the particle here in two different spots. That's going to simplify our equations. And then we have the density here of the water. And that's our equation there. <clears throat> So it's a good question, uh, Reese. I will, I will talk about that um, in a couple minutes. And I'll come back and, and I'll try to answer that directly. So the force of drag then, we have an equation that's essentially accounting for, the, again, that cross-sectional area of our sphere. And it's going to account for the velocity. So it turns out this equation is going to be three times the viscosity of water. So again, I'm going to put all these terms up here so you have them in place. Um, I know I'm kind of breezing through them right now. So we take the viscosity, we take pi, we take the um, velocity term and the diameter of the particle. So all these terms, this is accounting for um, the force of drag in a simple system where you have a sphere moving through water or moving through a fluid. Okay, and just to define all of these again for you, this page has everything. And one thing I'll note here is the uh, all the units are written out as you will typically um, need to use them in the equation that we're going to de derive based on the, uh, the force balance. Okay, so for the force of buoyancy is density, the density of just the water or density of the water being displaced. Um, the density of water is going to be the same as the density of water being displaced. So we have some amount of water being displaced. Um, in a specific system, that might change. You know, maybe if we're at 5 degrees Celsius, that means that's actually how we define exactly 1 kilogram per liter of water, or 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter of water. So you'll see that rho of water at 5 degrees Celsius is equal to 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So if you were to look that up, you'll get that. At, you know, 15 degrees Celsius or something, it's like 997 or something like that. And so that will change a little bit depending on the system, but the density of, of the water that you're using is going to be this, you know, the density doesn't change when you select just a small part of the, the water. So whatever the water density is, is going to be the density of the water displaced. Did that, did that answer the question? Um, let me know if it did not. Um, okay, so the, uh, the definitions here, we have the dynamic viscosity of water. You've probably seen this before. This is our mu. This is in kilograms per meter second. That, those are the units that are it's given in um, in the lookup table, although I think it's times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms per meter second. So make sure that when you look use the lookup table, um, you account for that 10, times 10 to the minus 3. That's given as part of the units there. The settling velocity, since we have meters and seconds up here, it's convenient to start converting everything into kilograms, meters, and seconds. So whenever you do these problems, I suggest to you that while you could convert everything to minutes and millimeters and grams or something weird like that, it's going to be a lot more convenient for you to use kilograms, meters, and seconds. So whatever the case, just make sure that you are converting units to use the same units because perhaps you are given of settling velocity, but it's in micrometers per hour or something. You know, convert that to meters per second. We have the diameter of the particle. Again, this is going to be a very small particle, maybe on the order of 10 micrometers. So be sure that you, you remember, again, what the micro means. This is 10 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. So make sure that you're not confused when you're solving the, the particle size parameters. 
Um, that's just an example for a particle. They're not all going to be that size. Um, so just a quick example there. Um, acceleration due to gravity, of course, you know this one, 9.81 meters per second squared. Um, if I give you a different planet, you know, if you have to solve a sedimentation process for the Death Star, that might be a different force of gravity, and that would certainly affect the system. And then we have the mass with some subscript, maybe mass of the water or mass of the particle, whichever one it is. Um, that's going to be just the mass, and again, use kilograms here, or convert to kilograms as needed. Volume of the particle, that's going to be um, pretty straightforward. Again, use it as cubic meters. It's going to be a very small volume for in expressed as cubic meters. Um, the rho p is going to be the density of the particle, and then the rho with no subscript is going to be the density of the water. And that's the, the temperature dependent one. Okay, so with all of these, we can derive, uh, you know, with these, uh, these force equations, we can derive a, an equation for the settling velocity. And again, this is exactly how you would um, solve for the essentially the set, settling velocity of a skydiver or the um, terminal velocity. This is the same the same practice in a sense. Um, in that case, there's really not not a lot of uh, buoyant force from the atmosphere because it's the atmosphere is so light. Um, so really, that becomes just the force of drag versus the force of um, gravity for them. In our case, we also have the buoyant force. And so the drag force is not going to be um, too big a deal, but let's give this a shot, right? So let's let's derive this. If we set up this system, we want to solve for the terminal settling velocity. So we can we know that force of gravity is the one pulling down, and at the terminal settling velocity, that happens when that force equals the opposing forces. So when the force of gravity is equal to the force of drag plus the force of buoyancy, that's the moment where we reach that critical settling velocity. We are no longer accelerating upwards or downwards. Okay, so then we have, let's go ahead and write it out. And I'm going to use the terms on the right because that's going to simplify easier for us. So we have volume of the particle times the rho of the particle times g. It's going to be equal to volume of the particle times the rho of the water times g plus 3 times the viscosity times pi times that velocity that we're looking for times the diameter of the particle. And so there's a there's a few things to do here. Um, and one thing that we will end up doing is taking the volume. And um, I'm not going to step through every, every tiny step because I don't need you guys to step through all of this. I'm going to essentially show you the, the process in which we're solving for Vs and then simplify to the equation that we're going to use and that you're going to be given. Okay, so let's just work towards getting that by itself for a moment. Um, let's just take the... Uh, let's do this. Let's take Vs equals... So essentially I'm going to first subtract this guy from both sides, and then in a moment I'm going to divide by a bunch of things, so we'll leave that division there. So we're going to take Vp rho p times g minus this term vp rho times g and then we'll take all of that divided by the stuff right here that was multiplied by the vs so we have pi of 3 mu and the diameter of the particle okay Let's simplify this a little bit and pull out the VP and the G. Then we have 
rho particle minus the rho of the water. So rho p minus rho. All that divided by um, pi times 3 times mu times diameter of the particle. Now, we know that our volume of the particle based on the volume of a sphere is, what is it, pi over 6 r cubed. What, what is the uh, volume of the sphere? Somebody, somebody type it in before I get there. Four-thirds pi r cubed. Come on, guys. You were supposed to get there before me. Um, OK, so four-thirds four -thirds pi r cubed. Now, if we take, um, there you go, thank you. So if we take the uh, this and we convert it to um, diameter, then we have four-thirds times essentially 1 over 2 dp, and we're cubing that whole thing. And so this becomes, um, so this 1 half to the cubed, that's cubing, 2 cubed is 8, right? So we get 4 divided by um, 8 times 3. So 8 times 3 is 24. 4 divided by um, 24 is 1 over 6. So it ends up simplifying to 1 over 6 dp cubed. OK, given that, um, we're going to go ahead and simplify on that basis. And so vs, we're left with, um, oh, yeah, what did happen to the pi? Pi. It's still there. <laughs> Thanks. Um, OK, so in this case, we. We're going to simplify so that we end up with, um, you know, the VP here is on top, so we're going to have pi, excuse me, pi times DP cubed um, times 1 over 6. So we'll take the 6 to the bottom, and our final equation is going to look like this. The 6 to the bottom gives us 18. We still have the mu at the bottom. The DP at the bottom, let's well, see, the pi will cancel with the pi because there's a pi on top and a pi on the bottom. The dp, one of them, the bottom one will cancel, and it'll be dp squared on the top. So we're going to be left with g on the top times this rho p minus rho. And then we're left with dp squared on top. OK, so that's our final answer, our final derivation. And you'll have this on your equation sheets, I think, I already have the first equation sheet for the first exam posted. Um, I'll double check that to make sure you have that um, set up to study with. But you'll have this equation, and hopefully now you have a, a good understanding of where these different pieces are coming from. Right? So this is just the, the force balance of the terminal velocity of a particle settling with the force of gravity, the force of drag, and the buoyant force acting on it. Okay, so this is the one we'll use. We're making some assumptions here. Perfect sphere. Um, the sphere is not combining in funny ways with other spheres. And ultimately, when we, we go into the sedimentation stuff, or the uh, coagulation stuff, when we do combine particles, we end up assuming they, they form a new perfect sphere and act in that, in that manner. Not exactly. Um, doesn't exactly make sense, but that's the, the thing of it. OK, so I wanted to take a couple looks, you know, I look at a couple of different um, sedimentation systems, and this can come help answer the question earlier about, um, you know, assuming there's some sort of sediment buildup, you know, at the in a tank when we're, we have a, maybe a retention pond or something, um, you know, what methods do we use to remove that sediment? Um, you know, as it grows more and more, well, there's a couple different cases. Um, if we have water flowing through a system and particles settling, 
out. Yeah, we would start collecting a bunch of sediment and then ultimately we would eventually overtop and have no more, we'd really have no more chamber anymore in a sense. Um, so instead, most systems have maybe a mechanical arm, which you see this thing here. Um, this is likely a mechanical arm that will sweep around and collect underneath the sediment and remove it every so often. Um, in a system where it's a, a rectangular s system here, um, you'd have a different type of scraper, but you'd probably have some scraper. These yellow things are probably designed to move across your system and scrape out the sediment every so often. Okay, so a, a, a question there is VS in the Y direction because particle um, yeah, okay, so it's a great question, and thanks also for the help answering it there. Um, the settling velocity, you're a, a tiny bit ahead of me, and it's perfect. It's a, a great thing. So as I just showed you, the, the trajectory of a particle, it, what we want to happen is for that particle to be on a trajectory where it hits the ground and is removed that way from the, the stream of the water before it reaches the edge of the tank, because then we, we have it collected. A lot of times we collect off the top, but still it's, we want it to settle before we get to that point. So that's our design criteria that let's assume that the water is being separate, you know, being collected <coughs> in this manner. So the VS, you're exactly right. VS is the vertical settling velocity. Um, so Technically, the particle, given this um, the flow term, the advection, taking it in the x direction, yes, that is uh, that is causing the net velocity to be diagonal. But really, what we're concerned about is this vertical component. So, in in that y direction, you're exactly correct. Okay. Now, one thing I wanted to mention here with these uh, nice photos of. Um, sedimentation chambers. Um, first of all, they're, they tend to be rather large, right? We we want to, a lot of flow to be going through them, so we need a lot of space. And that will become a little more clear. The, the design parameters actually ten, turns out to be the, um, the surface area at the bottom, and the math works out that way, that this, this kind of aerial view surface area turns out to be the most important parameter in terms of will or will not a, a uh, particle settle. Obviously the flow is important too, but in terms of designing the, the geometry of a system, that surface area is the most important. Okay, um, with that, uh, if we want to model one of these circular systems, and we're, we typically flow from the center to the edge, and that gives us um, a little bit of an advantage because the the flow you might you might see it in a way it sort of slows down because it's um, spreading out wider. Um, so the velocity across here, um, what we can do is we can just take a cross section of that slice, um, and this this one's you know underwater here that rectangle that's formed, if we look at the cross section right there, we can use, we can model the same way as if we were taking just a cross section of this rectangle um, right here where it's like pretty much top-down view so it's not working out very well and I can't draw apparently, but um, what we're looking at then is, you know, if in this picture, if this is the x direction I'm going to change my color here for you. If the distance um, from left to right, this is the x direction, and then this would be z, then coming out of the page, kind of at us, is y. Whereas on this graph, what I'm doing is I'm I'm taking a, um, instead of looking top down, I've taken it sideways. So instead of looking at my aquarium 
from above, which this picture is doing, what I'm doing is I'm looking at it from the side, right? So that's, that's what I'm doing here with this one, and that's a side view where y is in the up direction, x is this way, and then z here would be kind of out of the page. Okay, hopefully that makes sense um, how we're looking at this. So, and then in this, this case here, we would be looking at y direction is essentially, I meant to draw it kind of vertical, right? So y should be this vertical, x is the radius going away from the center, and then z would be, we're just not going to, I mean, it would be around the circle and that changes the geometry a little bit. We have to do like the circular stuff, but Z would be along that, along that radial axis or, you know, rotating, you know, Z would be that curve. Um, okay. So, um, to take a look at how we, how we map these um, parameters into determining whether or not or how to what extent particles are going to settle that's the picture that I want to use right I want to use this y direction upwards and x direction sideways um, and in a sense this is also going to be like time because a particle that has stayed in the system for some amount of time will have gone some amount of x distance based on the flow rate, not based on the settling velocity. The settling velocity will be taking it, um, we'll have a, um, if we were to look at a particle somewhere, we have settling velocity acting on it and the, the velocity from the flow acting on it that way. So we'll say v flow, which the book does not use, so I'm just adding this to to make a point, and we could look at this as, and here, um, this is going to connect with um, from the book. We need meters per second. So how fast is it going? Well, that's going to be um, essentially the uh, the flow divided by the cross sectional area should be. So flow divided by an area is going to leave us with meters per second. And so if we have in the z direction you know, something like this, then the, uh, the cross-sectional area here becomes important because to understand that velocity of the flow there we need that area. So I'm going to keep things a, a little simpler for the moment so we can uh, take a closer look at all this but we will come back to that concept and uh, elaborate there. Um, okay so I'm going to erase a little bit of stuff here. Good enough. I'm going to move this stuff because I'm going to use that drawing area. Um, what if there's a tool? So we have that velocity due to the flow, we have the velocity due to the settling, and that hopefully will be a helpful, helpful in understanding this system. Okay, so then the question becomes, given some height of a particle, so if a particle starts off in the system right here, we have on the this x, we have the height of the particle, or excuse me, on the y axis. So that height um, is going to be important, it's going to be in meters. We want for to design our system so that the height of a particle at the top, so when if we have the height of the particle and the height of the whole system being h. So the height of the whole system is h. Then for, if we want complete removal of every particle, we want to design it so that when hp equals h, 
this is the particle that's hardest to remove. And by hardest, I mean that's the one that um, has the furthest to go. So we're going to design our system so that this one that has the furthest to fall is going to make it hopefully to the ground before, um, before the water escapes, right? So that's our design parameter then, is um, that complete removal, we want HP equal to H. So given that, what we're going to do is we're going to say that HP is equal to the velocity term times the amount of time the water spends inside the system. So we're going to say that the height of the system, if we're designing the height, needs to be equal to the Vs, that terminal velocity that we calculated based on the particle, times the hydraulic retention time. So this is the same thing as saying Vs times V over Q. V over Q is our, our theta, hydraulic retention time. So <clears throat> the height of the particle can be described in that in that way. And when we are designing for complete sedimentation, we're going to say that's equal to the height of the basin. <clears throat> okay, so there's one other term here that I want to introduce, and that is V naught. So V naught we're going to describe as the critical settling velocity. This is going to be what we call our design criterion that that is the velocity <clears throat> that achieves exact removal so when we have a particle that exact is exactly removed this component that's v naught <clears throat> so we decide we de describe a system <clears throat> excuse me we describe a system based on that settling, that critical settling velocity. So we can compare a system if we have, I'll use a, a different color here, if we have a different settling trajectory, and this I'm going to call Vs1, or maybe we can have another one where we have a separate settling trajectory. We'll call this, I'm sorry, that, that's probably, calling it Vs is probably not the right term. Um, rather, I should draw it as this is Vs2, and then this other one, is, the downward component is Vs, Vs1. Okay, so depending on what particle we have, we can, we can see that some of them will settle, and some of them may not settle based on that velocity. And so what we're going to do is we're going to compare our settling velocity that we observe to the critical settling velocity, which is the exact velocity, downward velocity, that would cause a particle to be completely removed. It's the minimum velocity required. So as we can see here, in this case, the way I've drawn it, Vs1 is faster than V0, which is faster than Vs2. Um, so you see that, right? It, the flow doesn't change. We have the same flow rate. The Vs1 is dropping faster and has settled easily. The V0 is dropping a little slower. And I could erase some of this stuff. So V naught is drawing is dropping a bit slower, and V S2 is even slower. Now one thing you might be able to notice here is that if we have a system that's flowing um, relatively, uh, at, I don't know, perfectly, at some point we're going to have, if we, if we were to take this distance from there to here, any particle that started off 
at that same distance below, they will eventually be removed because at that same rate, they can be removed. So some particles will be removed in the one case, but not all. Um, whereas all of the particles in V that, that fall at the terminal velocity of the critical settling velocity, all of those will be removed, and anything faster than it will also be removed. So those are, that's what I wanted to describe in terms of the terms. We've also now derived uh, this component, the settling velocity. We have some relationship here. We could rearrange this and say the settling velocity is equal to the height times Q divided by the volume. And from here, you'll notice that the height and the volume, the volume in terms of a, um, a rectangular system, that's very simple. And the height in terms of a cylinder also has, the volume in terms of a cylinder also has a height component. So the height is very easy to simplify. So the, the settling velocity in both cases, regardless of if it's rectangular or if it's um, circular settling, the height is going to be excuse me, the settling velocity is going to be equal to Q over the area. And that's actually uh, what I mentioned earlier. But we'll come back and we will highlight this again because we're out of time today. This is an equation that you're going to need to recognize and use when designing these systems. So we will come back and give it some more attention. Um, hopefully I answered all the questions that came up. Um, Thank you, thank you for the questions, and thank you as well for um, bearing with me with the sound. I apologize that I had to make the last minute adjustments. Um, so we'll, we'll pick up here on Thursday. Remember to take a look at the homework. I will also try to post your first quiz um, probably later today uh, for kind of some of the chemistry material. All right, so I'm going to sign off. I think it allows me to answer questions um, from here. If you ask them, I think the feed remains open, at least for some amount of time. So I will try to, to do that for you if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, I will see you next time. Goodbye. For